Maybe, maybe. No. Um, I think we have accurately started the Hangout on Air. Right? Where is it broadcasting? Is it broadcasting to the right? It's working. It's working. It's working. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to DevOps Bootcamp yet again. Uh, we are going to talk about today development tools and debuggers. So we have a platter of delicious tools for you to try. It's just this quick sampling of each and every one. Um, and so I'm Ian. This is Lucy. Without further ado, um, so one uh, important one important place to start is the difference between static analysis and dynamic analysis. It's really easy to divide debugging tools down this line. Tools either look at your code and don't compile it, and just try and guess whether things work properly based off of how the code looks, or they compile and run your code and then keep track of it somehow. Keep track of where where in your code that it, it's flow, it's flowing, um, which paths are being taken through your code, and, and so if it's static analysis, it doesn't run the code. If it's dynamic analysis, it runs the code. Um, you've actually encountered this before. You've probably made a statically allocated array and then a dynamically allocated array. You know, one which is allocated at runtime versus at compile time. So. Um, another difference is stuff like printing variables, uh, which is something that's maybe even a little bit more accessible, where like anytime that you aren't really sure what your code is doing, uh, the first thing you're probably taught is like just print stuff, and then you can see at least some of what your code is doing. Um, and that's an example of static analysis that'll maybe give you that, that'd be dynamic because it's running. Better idea. Yes. Um, so then uh, I guess another thing to kind of talk about. Uh, is what debugging even really is before we really get into the guts of what a debugger is. Um, so like I said, there's a couple of really simple examples that you might not think of as explicitly being debugging, but that um, kind of help you uh, figure out why your code isn't working. So like one example I gave was putting variables on there is just error messages. Um, oftentimes, if your code is whatever tool you're using, whether it's like uh, C and you're using a compiler um, or even Python that's being mm -hmm. interpreted. I mean, whatever you're using to make your code go, so to speak, um, it probably has at least some error messages for whatever uh, pretty basic errors you run into. Stuff like syntax errors if you're missing a semicolon. For um, C, it might be as simple as segmentation fault, which is one kind of error, or it might be a highly detailed backtrace of every single function call throughout your code. Yes, some error messages are more helpful than others. Uh, there's the occasional one where it's like, error message, this is an error message, and you're like, thanks. Um, another one is syntax highlighting. That's another thing that people don't usually think of as being a debugging tool, uh, but it's definitely something that will help you really easily spot uh, kind of where your code isn't working. Um, so do people feel like they have a good handle on like, what debugging in general is and kind of being in that mindset of, trying to find flaws in your code or make it better. Kind of, that makes sense. Um, and this is a uh, internal survey. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone can read it, but. So um, debuggers are really interesting. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but uh, there's a common theme is typically they attach to your program. And uh, if it's like a, if you're debugging C code or some sort of compiled code, usually you have to compile it with special symbols. And these symbols are uh, little, little references just stuck straight in the executable, which says this part of the code here, it actually represents something over there in that C source file. So your debugger can you know, reference the C source file where the, where the code came from to the executable. Um, Interpretive languages also have debuggers. Uh, a good example is PDB, the Python debugger, or node double dash de debug for Node.js. Um, PDB is what we're going to be doing um, our activity with. 
Uh, so you'll kind of get a chance to see like how it works and uh, why it's useful. Uh, speaking of why debuggers are useful, uh, like we said, sometimes error messages and printing audio variables and all those other kind of natural debuggers that we were talking about uh, kind of fail us. Um, so here's an example of a printout where it's like just question marks. Like even Unicode is like, man, I don't know. Uh, so um, what on earth is wrong? We're getting a segmentation call. We don't even know what's being printed. Uh, this is where a debugger is most useful. Um, a lot of times, especially in like a really complex code base or something where it's like you didn't write it yourself, um, it's really hard to look at your code and know what exactly is going wrong to mm -hmm. cause this. Um, and so a debugger will help. Maybe this is the next slide. Um, uh, yeah. Um, an example is I was uh, messing around with a really cool just-in-time compiler, this fancy program, and it was a neat and I couldn't understand what on earth was going on, so I just stuck a breakpoint right in the middle of the program. And then from there, I started exploring, okay, what are all the var values of all these variables? What are their types? Where did the types come from? What files is everything in? Okay, I'm gonna go put a breakpoint over there where I think the problem is. And I just kind of worked my way through. And just by you know jumping from breakpoint to breakpoint, function to function, loop to loop, I was able to figure out you know, how this massive piece of code, which I didn't know about the day before, worked. Um, so for those who don't know, a breakpoint is essentially um, a place in your code where you say, like, I want to stop here and kind of assess where we're at. Um, so if usually you can kind of narrow down where code is breaking. Like, maybe there's one line where you're like, I'm not really sure what this is doing. So you would set a breakpoint there. And then you could get more details about um, how your code's being executed. So that's what he means by a breakpoint. Typically, what will happen is you, you set this breakpoint, and depending on your debugger, there's different ways to do it. We'll go into some of them. You'll set this point, and you say stop right before this line. And you, the, the debugger will run your code up until that line, and then stop. And then you can say, okay, now I want to print some variables. Now I want to go in, and I want to change this value in the code and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are kind of some of the ways that debuggers are really useful. Um, so another tool, which is excellent if you're going to be writing a lot of C, uh, is Valgrind. Valgrind is a memory checker tool. Checker tool. Um, so it, what it does is it runs your code. Once again, it's a dynamic tool. And it checks to make sure that when you access a piece of memory, you have uh, it's either on the stack or you have allocated it. It checks to make sure that all of your allocations are cleaned up. Um, it's kind of a robotics, honestly. It'll just spew a ton of messages. But then if you just read like the first line of each message, it'll tell you roughly what's going on. And then the rest is typically a, a stack trace or a trace of what's, what, well, how you got there. Um, for instance, uh, sure, it is conditional jump or move depends on uninitialized values. This is something I ran into yesterday um, in a pile of C code I wrote. And uh, you guys are all going to be writing a lot of C for operating systems, for data structures. Let me tell you, in data structures, you're going to have some nasty memory leaks, and Valgrind is going to be your best friend. Um, but a conditional jump, well, it's like an if statement which depends on a variable which hasn't been initialized yet. So say you create a variable, integer i, and then you say, if i, then go do something. Well, what if you haven't initialized i or given it a value? i could be anything. Um, and it tells me that this conditional jump error was in my print token, oh look, right on line 36, which was triggered by my test from line 54, which was triggered from elsewhere in my text. So, so I can really quickly see what line the problem was on and how I got there. Um, in the, at the very bottom, Valgrind will tell you this leaked summary. And this leaked summary tells me that I lost 192 bytes in eight blocks. Usually it's way scarier than it actually is. Yeah. So like 192 bytes, oh my god. It means that I ran my program, I called this function three times and you know, I lost, maybe I called it four times, and I lost two, two blocks each time. 
Um, another thing uh, that can sometimes be really useful is this idea of code coverage um, and tools that test um, your code's coverage. So that's kind of the idea of like use cases. Um, so uh, testing. Testing is really important. We're going to give a whole lecture based off of testing. Um, based on testing. So one way, it, all the times you test your code, you're not actually sure, like, well, did I really test all my code? Yeah, I wrote a test, but I'm not sure how much of my code it covers. So Go has this really cool tool, which is uh, one of the sexier versions I've seen, where it'll run your code, and then it says, this, this, page, this file, 53% of the code was covered, and this code was covered really well, and this code was covered not at all. In other words, this code was tested, this code was not. Go write tests for this. Yeah, and there's a lot of other, we'll get into integrated development environments a little bit later, but that's another place where there's a lot of plugins and various tools that will help you um, determine which parts of your code are being properly tested or not. Um, and it's also really helpful for websites. I think that's something that people don't really think about testing very very often, um, but there are some really cool uh, website tests um, that will test like whether certain pages on your site are throwing errors, whether they only throw errors in certain cases, like um, if a user tries to log in with the last name null or something, <laughs> like is your, is your database going to break, stuff like that. Um, so another thing, uh, how many of you guys know about coding standards or uh, kind of rules to write code by? Yeah, like PEP8 and stuff. Um, excellent. That's actually a lot of hands. Good. Uh, so kind of similar to how in English we have some conventions by which we write English. You capitalize the first letter, you put period at the end of a sentence. Uh, very similarly in code, we have some conventions by which we write code. Uh, for instance, Python has a very strict and verbose uh, compilation, I guess. It's yeah. called PEP8, uh, and it's essentially a set of rules saying, like, you know, indents should be four spaces instead of tabs. Um, your lines should not be more than 80 characters, stuff like that. Here's an example from PEP8. Um, absolute imports are recommended, so they're usually more readable and tend to be better than paid. So basically, don't do this. And uh, every language will have their own uh, sort of coding conventions. Uh, for instance, like Java will obviously have a completely different set of coding conventions than Python will because they're entirely different languages and they're written very differently. Uh, like, you know, Python's not going to have anything to say about semicolons, but in C, if you forget a semicolon, like your code's not even going to run. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind coding standards. Some of them are very cultural uh, and won't actually like affect how your code runs um, and are really more guidelines, I guess. But some of them are um, a little bit stricter and things you really need to be aware of. Um, however, there, I don't know if this is the next slide, but there are, there are some example standards. Um, well, I just want to mention that there's stuff that will like automatically yeah. check whether you're, so there are tools that will automatically check whether your code complies to standards or not. And we'll, Again, the, the activity will include some of those. Uh, stuff like Flategate, which will check whether your Python code uh, complies with the PEP8 standard. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't necessarily have to like, memorize an entire manual and then code directly according to it. There's kind of a spell checker, I guess, for code, essentially. But anyway, moving on. Um, so style guides. Sometimes, uh, like Lucy said, the, it's just kind of cultural. And it will make a big difference. Um, and sometimes style guidelines, like first of all, good style guidelines are pretty short. They're on the order of maybe 10 pages, um, which if my code is going to be more understandable and run better and have fewer say faults, if I read 10 pages, sign me up. Fewer say faults for 10 pages of reading? Yes, yes, please. Um, one funny thing is there's sometimes uh, rival guidelines. For instance, in C, there's this GNU coding standards, and then there's also this other uh, style, like the Linux kernel style. 
And so uh, Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux kernels, said, you know, uh, he, he recommends burning the other style guidelines. Um, so they can be fun to read. Others are a bit more serious. The NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they make spaceships. Um, they cannot afford to have a bug in their code because otherwise the spaceship may not turn on. And that is something which, which happens not infrequently. And so they are, are really big fans of automated tooling, tooling to check to make sure that their code is correct. Um, and so they'll go on and on about how they must have everything in the code must be statically determined and statically checked. And have kind of like the quote says, uh, strict bounds. Um, do you want to take this one too? Sure, Linters. Uh, so Lucy mentioned that there were, there were these excellent tools which will tell me where there are bugs in my code potentially and where it violates style guidelines. For instance, uh, with Python code, you can use this tool called Playgate. Um, and you know, before you push code, give code to a large uh, open source project, it's usually a good idea to just run Playgate and see where are all the style, uh, style bugs. And, um, you know, I, I ran this on uh, friend's code. This is actually the code which she'll be talking about tomorrow night at Love. So it looks like it's even got some problems. But um, uh, it, most of the time it's little things, like your line is too long. It should be shorter. Um, but other times it, it's, it's like for a binary operator. That means, you know, you have one plus one, but you put a line break after the plus so that one, the second one is on the next line, that can be just confusing to read, and you should really fix that. Uh, so similarly, like, not everything is just in Python. This is an example of some code from a C, C++ one. Um, so another really important thing that kind of goes along with the idea of, like, linting and coding standards a little bit yeah. uh, is the idea of type checking. So different languages will have different uh, philosophies, I guess you could say, or um, ways that they deal with types. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Python has a uh, duck type. So there's statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages. Like types which are uh, determined at compile time versus runtime. It's the same paradigm for seeing again and again. So Python is something called a duckly type language, where they say, like, well, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. And it will just automatically determine your types for you. Um, but C, on the other hand, you have to specify what every the type of everything. Um, and once that thing is of that type, it will not change at all. And you cannot treat it as any other type ever. Um, so, so one advantage of static typing, strong typing like C, is you get uh, some assurances from the compiler that the wrong data will not go down this tube. This function only accepts integer arguments. Um, so I can be sure that I'm not going to get something weird. But it, it really, you lose a lot of flexibility, where if uh, your types are determined at runtime, then you have a whole lot more options. Like, well, I know that a, a, a floating point number will fit down that tube perfectly well, but when my compiler does it, I'm just going to you know, throw floating point numbers and it goes down that tube. <coughs> Yeah, and the idea with this slide is that um, oftentimes uh, there will be kind of nuances to that type checking system. And you'll sometimes end up with a lot of warnings being like, hey, uh, this isn't a problem right now, but it could be in the future. And you'll be like, oh, it's just a warning. I don't need to worry about it. Uh, and then it'll come back and bite you in the ass later. So, um, like, pay attention to your warnings. I didn't pay attention to this warning, and it caused a sick fall. Oops, shit. Yeah, uh, that's a little bit of a, we should probably practice what we preach, but um, anyway. Uh, call graphs. Call graphs are this really cool thing. If you jump into a big project, and you don't know what's going on, but you just want some idea of how the code is structured. Uh, call graphs are great. What they do is it's a graph of what function calls which function, and you can just, you know, there are different tools which will generate these graphs, and so you take this tool, like pi call graph, don't you know, call it on the main file, and it will go through that file and say, 
the main function calls this other function, calls this other function, and make a pretty chart. Um, so I can say, oh, well, I know that this parser is connected. It calls the lexer. It would be the other way around. But, but, uh, and how they all fit together. Uh, and this is especially useful, again, for code that's not necessarily yours. Um, it's the kind of thing where I know that when you're writing like a program for 160 or 161, you're like, oh, I already know what functions are calling what functions. But when you walk into a code base that's either one huge or two you haven't written or three both, um, a lot of times stuff like this can be really useful yeah. in attempting to understand better um, kind of how your code actually works. Um, so one really useful tool that, again, I think a lot of people don't really think of uh, is the web console. Um, there's a couple different ways to get to it. Uh, you can either like right click and do inspect element, or there's some uh, shortcuts, or like F12 works, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there she is. Um, so this is, you can see that console is highlighted right here. Um, and this is essentially like a JavaScript console where I can run, uh, I don't know, there's not a lot of interesting JavaScript I don't think to run at the moment. Um, but That's you can. Like alert for the world or something. Oh, sure. Uh, an alert pops up. Um, so you can see uh, this is JavaScript speak for you know, pop up a little box and say hello world, and then it just runs it. Um, it'll also, uh, the purpose of these little things is to show you errors that occur um, with any of these different kind of like uh, categories, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if there's a problem with your CSS, lots of blue bubbles which have to say CSS are going to pop up and say, hey, uh, this isn't a thing, and you should really fix it. If your website's vulnerable to something that's really obvious, then the security, you'll have little security warnings, um, stuff like that. So this is something that's super useful if you are um, building a website. Um, there's other things like this inspector will look at your HTML. So we can inspect um, all these different, uh, this, is, this one's pretty big. But well, you probably just click on one of the slides and show them what, what's in one of the slides. Um, and we can potentially even just change the style in one of the slides. Maybe we want to make something bold. Um, or we could say, well, we want to delete that slide altogether. Let's, uh, let's see what happens with, with, with the presentation where we just delete the slide, which we're probably not going to do. But, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's just something to be aware of if you're ever, you ever find yourself writing JavaScript or other web-based web things. Um, OK. Does anyone have any questions on debuggers before we move on to more development tool, more generic kind of stuff? Um, any questions about like, why would I ever use that, or that's confusing, or? We went really fast through a lot of tools. We do a lot of cool things. And I encourage you to check these out if you um, write Lua. You should probably check out what the Lua style guide is and when there's a Lua link. Um, Sweet. Um, actually, I wonder if we could digress here a little bit. Does, do people want to do the activity right now while debuggers are still kind of fresh and like also we've been talking for a long time? Um, or do we want to do kind of the second half of the lesson and then do the activity at the very end? Thoughts? Uh, is the activity of like the activity is mostly a debugging thing. There are actually two activities. Uh, well, uh, there's, one, there's an advanced and a not advanced. So it's not a, a there's two types of, yeah. there's, that makes sense. One for the daring people and one for those who aren't as comfortable with C. I do. Let's just power through and then do all the stuff at the end. Or was, sorry, wait, what did, what did you want to do, or? Uh, did, are you sure? What? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's just go ahead, so that'll be better in the video. Right? Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, 
So uh, I guess the problem that this is trying to solve is like, what can we do to make writing code easier? Um, Vim is sometimes not helpful with this, so we'll, we'll show you some, some things that you can do to make writing code easier. Uh, so one thing, which we actually had a very heated discussion about adding this to the slide deck, uh, so I will kind of make my case for it. Uh, virtual environments, which we've shown you guys before, uh, are essentially tools that um, kind of containerize your uh, Python dependencies. So essentially, when you create a virtual environment, uh, you are saying, hey, Python, I want you to use this directory uh, to run binaries out of. And then, uh, so like when you install something, it will install to that directory instead of on your entire system. This it's is like taking all of your libraries, putting them in a box, and telling Python, look in this box. This box is where all of the libraries are. And if you see any other libraries elsewhere on the system, don't look at them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, it's like look in that box first, right? Because like, yeah, yes, something yes. else. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that. that's yeah. true. He's, look, look in this box first. Yeah, he's got a point. So there's uh, yeah. paths? Paths. There's a Python path, but we're not going to go into that. OK. okay. Um, so the reason that virtual is useful um, is that when you're making a project, you will oftentimes have a lot of dependencies. And it's really hard to keep track of them all. But when someone else wants to use your project, they're going to need to install those as well. So virtual environments make it really easy to know what dependencies your project has because they're everything that's installed in your little box. You don't install anything that you didn't really need. Or maybe you did like one or two, but that's not a big deal. The point is that you don't have to say, hey, Python, I need you to go through all of the libraries that are on my laptop right now and figure out which ones I'm using in this project, because that's a lot of work. Um, or, for example, um, one is for one website I write, we use Django 1.7. For another, we use Django 1.5. They're different, they're not compatible, and so I, I need to be able to switch very quickly and easily between the two. So one minute I'm working on one website, and the other minute I'm working on another. So that's why virtual environments are really useful. They're really unique to Python, um, so you won't. Not in a good way. So you probably <laughs> won't see them. Um, really anywhere else. But if you do a lot of Python coding, like they're pretty important, I think. Uh, so the code up there is just a little bit about like how to make one and um, activate it. And then I think the next slide is using it. Uh, so yeah, you pip install, it's the Python package manager's pip. Um, and once you're done, you deactivate and that will uh, sort of jump you out of the virtual environment. Yep. Yay. Speaking of package managers, um, oh yes. Yeah, good question. Is pip included with Python? No. Okay. Uh, Neither is virtual env. I don't think. I think you have to install virtual env. This story is actually a bit more complicated. It is included with Python three, but not Python two. It depends on your distribution, okay. etc. If you're running Ubuntu, no. Gotcha. Because I just installed Python three. Yeah. Um, there's this thing called, in Python 3 called Pion, and PIP, I think, I'm not sure, it's probably PIP 3, you might know for PIP 3, okay. but this is the answer. Um, so package managers, you all, all should know by now about package managers like Act, Git, and Yum. Um, you probably use one or both. Um, I know on the CentOS systems, the CentOS virtual machines we're using, we use Yum. Um, but sometimes, you know, those CentOS packages for Python are really old. And when you're doing development, you might even want the bleeding edge, or at least something which is a little bit newer than 2010. Um, and so uh, that's one big advantage of these development libraries. Um, another is these uh, development package managers can uh, typically host a wider array of packages. Typically, a, uh, you'll, you'll only be able to get the most popular packages in, uh, in your system library, but not some of the less popular ones we run down the street name. And he can just upload his package to, to the universe. Um, 
There's also uh, language specific package managers. Yes. So like we were talking about pip is a Python specific package manager. Um, and similarly, like Ian said, your operating system has one. So like when you type sudo yum install, you're just calling yum. And that's uh, the package manager specific to your entire oh. operating system. Um, and pretty much every language will honestly have a package manager. Ruby, every one that I use, Ruby, Node, um, Go. Go does not have a package manager. I thought it did. It does not. Oh. Um, it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> not in my humble opinion. Other people disagree with me, but I think it's a problem. Uh, C, package manager, what's that? That's way too oh, that's true. Um, C++? No. Java? No. Um, kind of. But not really. Um, uh, so a lot of the hip interpreted languages tend to have package managers. A lot of the older compiled languages do not. That's how it breaks down. Um, examples: pip for Python, npm, Node package manager for Node.js, um, and so on. They can make Node.js. The, that one takes care of all of your virtual environments for you, so you don't even need to think about it. Um, yeah. Uh, so now we come to the fabled integrated development environments. Um, these are essentially, uh, like, you know how we usually use Vim or maybe some of these Sublime to edit code in? Um, so an integrated development environment is essentially a text editor with a lot, 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 lot of other mm -hmm. features. Um, for instance, it'll like complete some of your, uh, like as you're typing, it'll complete some of the things you're writing. So for instance, if I type an open paren, it'll usually automatically add a closed paren, and then I just need to type like tab or enter or something, and it will actually fill it in. Um, it'll automatically sometimes add like semicolons if you're doing uh, Java or C or C++. They typically um, have a lot of tools built in. That's why they're integrated. You have this developing environment on your command line where you can call Flightgate or uh, you know in order to parse your parse your file and then to edit your file and GCC to compile your file. Whereas in an integrated developing environment, you don't need to worry about calling all these things. You just hit a button to compile and it will automatically lint your code for you. And it'll print all your error messages, mm -hmm. it'll highlight where stuff's going wrong and what's going wrong. Um, It'll do a lot of it for you, honestly. And in, integrated development environments are kind of interesting, at least in our subculture, because a lot of people don't use them. Um, and there's there's a lot of pros and cons, I guess, is, is what I'd say. So I would definitely recommend trying it out. And I think if you're in the CS track, they do have you try Eclipse, um, because it, there are some really amazing and really useful things that IDEs do. Um, and if you're looking for one, Eclipse, is usually a good one for, uh, especially for, for Java, but. Uh, IDEs are kind of uh, very dependent on the language you're using. If you're using Java, you want to use Eclipse. Um, if you're using C++ on Windows, oh, you should be using Visual Studio. Don't even think about using anything else. Uh, if you're using Python, you know, there is a uh, integrated developing environment for Python, but most of the Python community uses different tools. And um, there's, there's kind of a, a difference in philosophy. There's people who want everything in one place so they don't have to think about it. And there's people who, re who recognize that, you know, I can just grab this new tool from over here, which works a little bit better than my old tool, and I just have this collection of tools I know how to use, and I don't need to think about, um, I want a little more control. I want to choose which text editor I'm going to use, and not just use the one which came with my IDE. Um, yeah, stuff like that. So, um, are there any questions about these before we move on? Um, here's a little uh, mini okay. manifesto. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's useful. Sometimes it's not. Use it your own discretion. I would say on that note, um, so a lot of well, those can actually be really helpful in teaching you, uh, like an IDE that has all those nice autocompletes and everything. You can learn a lot about a language like Java or Python. Uh, then you got to watch out for becoming dependent 
So your brain depends on thinking those things. So I recommend using one as a learning tool. Um, because if you use it as your main thing, you'll become dependent and you can't go remotely on a server, all kinds of things. Yeah, and that is one really big thing. I think a big reason why uh, our little niche doesn't really use them is that if you're on a server, it's not going to have an IDE ever. Uh, you're pretty much limited to Vim and Emacs. Yes. Another yes. Really weird thing, like I know I try to use Visual Studios, and I try to just copy code over Putty, submit it, like all the stuff that I've worked with Visual Studios wouldn't work on Putty. Mm -hmm. So I can compensate for that, and Putty didn't obviously have that to compensate for it. Yeah, so there's sometimes different dialects of languages. You're usually using the like Visual Studio C++, which is different than the standard C++, which everyone else uses. From like, like 1985 or whatever. Yeah. That's on Flip. Yeah. The, the, the version on C++, of C++ on Flip will only compile C++ as new as 1999 and kind of screw it up otherwise. Um, uh, I think we should still talk about these despite dropping the ball. Sorry we dropped the ball on finishing this. But we weren't sure about this slide because we're going to have a whole day on testing. So it's like, do we get to it or not? Um, <laughs> but um, so I guess just to give you guys a taste of like testing and unit testing, um, it's basically the idea like we were talking about coverage earlier. Uh, it's basically like making sure that your code works. So you say like, okay, I have this function and I know what's going to go in and I know what's going to come out. So I'm going to write a test that basically tests um, whether if I put in X, I get out what I expect to get out. Um, and that'll essentially make sure that your code was running how you were expecting it to do. Down where your code may use some improvement um, or where it's failing. Uh, it can also help, uh, especially in open source, with making sure that whatever code people are sending you actually works how you need it to, so you're not just blindly accepting uh, code from strangers. Um, I typically find that if I am writing a big project to just kind of span more than like two files. I'm going to screw up somewhere. And I need tests to make sure that my code actually works the way I think it does. Because if it doesn't, I'm going to discover halfway through that, oh no, this thing over here doesn't work the way I planned it to. So maybe they'll try and compensate for it, which is a really bad idea. Um, so test your code. And there's lots of frameworks that'll help you do this. Again, like there's something you need, there's a tool that makes it easier probably. Um, so uh, for pretty much every major language that you're gonna use, there's going to be one or more um, testing frameworks that will uh, make it easier to just say like, hey, I need to you know, write a test really quickly. Um, they're typically part of the standard library. Yeah. Um, so this is that is a little more on the planning side of things. It's a little bit less of, well, I guess it is a tool. That's probably why I'm putting it in here. Um, so the unified modeling language is basically a way to, um, before you actually sit down and start coding, uh, map out what your code needs to do. So it's uh, kind of similar to the idea of testing. You want to look at what each function and class and um, relationship is doing, what it's trying to accomplish, how different functions relate to each other, and how different objects relate to each other. Um, there are several different kinds of like graphs and uh, ways of structuring your data to kind of convey your point. Um, but again, if you're in a CS track, Unified Modeling Language or UML is definitely something you're going to see. Probably first in databases, I think, where you'll... That's ER diagrams, which is similar to mm, We used UML. Okay. But yeah, so uh, for like a personal project, this isn't a necessarily something you're going to need to do. But if you're working in a really big team, you need to communicate like, here's what I'm expecting that this project, this really large project will look like. Um, then it kind of is a central like blueprint, essentially, for That's what it is. a project. Yeah. Um, there's a lot There's different ideas. Some people think that UML is unnecessary. Different. Yeah. Are we so is it just like standardized pseudocode? Yeah, that's a kind of it's like visual pseudocode. It's like you have boxes with names. 
um, and like arrows pointing to different places. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the idea is like planning before you code. Uh, and I actually, I should have put some examples, but if you'd like, we can pull up an example of the UML diagram. Regular expressions. These are a uh, whole mini programming language, which is typically included like the standard library of Python or Perl. Like if you're in Perl, you know all about regular expressions. Um, so what they're good for is they are good for parsing text. If you um, need to find and replace things across your entire directory, this is a, this is a good chance to read these regular expressions. Um, they're very powerful, they're very complicated, it's very easy to wind up with an absolutely Byzantine regular expression, which is a mile long, which nobody can read, including you, tomorrow when you wake up in the morning. Um, so, we just gave you a quick example. Um, so, s slashes are escapes, I think is the key, like, you'll see that everywhere, uh, and that's essentially saying, uh, either like, Maybe a paren is a special character and you want it to actually be a paren, or uh, in the case of this D, I'm just guessing, uh, it makes it into a special character. So it kind of toggles between special and non special characters. So the, the slash D says we want a digit, um, and the plus says we want at least one digit and maybe more digits. Um, and this slash parenthesis. He says we want a real parenthesis, not just this special parenthesis. Um, slash D, you know, more numbers. So basically, it'll match anything with this form. One parenthesis, 787, 100, 100. This, this is a sort of form which this will match. Um, you, you actually use them already. If you've copied, you know, copy star to assignment two, you, you've used uh, regular experiments. Star is um, a wild card, yeah. so it says anything. Uh, so regular expressions have uh -huh. their uh, limitations. There are different types of grammars, like natural languages are more powerful than programming languages, and programming languages are more powerful than regular expressions. And you can look up why that is, and what Noam Chomsky's language hierarchy is. It's cool, but it's not relevant. Um, um, but you can't parse HTML, for example, using a regular expression. So you can't say, like, uh, you know, for a list or something, like, slash star, slash list, like, that's I don't, just not going to work. They have their limitations. Uh, so another thing that we wanted to bring up is development servers. And again, this is something that you guys have already seen with the web application. Python system view on the system view app, and it comes up with that little like 127.0.0.1. Um, that is something called a development server. So essentially, it locally serves uh, whatever project you're working on so that you can see it and play with it without having to put it on quote unquote a real server. Like a patch or internet or complicated and hard to start. Yeah, like when I first started programming, actually, I tried to install XAM to like actually make my laptop into like partially a server and it was just a mess. So uh, lots of tools have made that a lot easier. Um, so you can just type like a magical incantation and it will serve up your files from your computer. And I think that's it. Yeah. Yay. Any questions? Questions please? Who's have questions? Um, if there are no questions, then um, if you guys go to github.com slash DevOps Bootcamp slash exercises. Um, so yeah, that would be excellent actually. Um, and then under debuggers and dev tools, uh, there's two uh, kind of, I guess they're directories, but there's two activities here. This one is the more complex one. So it's literally like Ian was working on something yesterday and ran into a problem. It was like, this might be useful to people who are interested in seeing Valgrind and um, really low level stuff like that. So if you're looking for kind of challenge, you already 
use the buggers a little bit and you just want to get better at it, uh, this memory leaks is definitely for you. Um, if you're uh, not so sure or like haven't used a debugger before, I definitely recommend the cleanup system view. And those should both have pretty complete instructions on how the activity should go. I hope that's reasonable. Um, yeah, and let me figure out how to stop this. Yeah, you're running, running.